What a time to have you. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> So if you look at everything that's happening in the market, of course, you know, let's go back even just a couple of weeks now to the Luna situation, because that was something that you were intimately involved with. And, you know, now it's a good time to kind of look back because it hasn't been the only one. If you look back, what are some of the lessons learned? Yeah, listen, I think <clears throat> Luna was the first kind of part of this crisis and it started a daisy chain of events. And if there's a lesson, learned was that the industry, plenty of retail investors, really had very, very little concept of risk management. And listen, what was interesting about Luna was it was very transparent, right? It was all public. It was all on the blockchain. People knew if they paid attention the bet they were making. Uh, the bet turned out not to work, uh, and it unraveled very quickly. Uh, what I don't think people expected was the magnitude of losses that would show up in, you know, professional institutions' balance sheets. And that caused a daisy chain of effects. Uh, companies like <clears throat> Celsius and Three Arrows and Genesis and Blockchain.com and you name it, they're all in the, this is all public information now, had exposure. And then the Three Arrows situation, which we'll see, you know, if it was legitimate or if there was fraud involved, uh, you know, really started that flywheel of, of credit losses. And it turned into a full-fledged credit crisis, right, with complete liquidation uh, and huge damage to confidence in the space, into the infrastructure of the space. Uh, three, four, five, six big institutions either declaring Chapter 11 or de facto doing the same thing by putting up gates and stopping retail deposits from leaving. Um, I used to say, not to be an I told you so, but I would stay with talking to industry groups. I was like, we need to self-regulate or the regulators are coming. And when you look back, there was very little self-regulation. Uh, there was inane risk management where companies took massive leverage uh, took asset liability mismatch, which means they had short-term deposits and they, let, they lent them out long. I mean, those are the two ways people always go bankrupt. <laughs> this is a, a tale as old as time. And it happened, and it happened in lots of ways. That's greed, that's ignorance. Um, it's frustrating as heck because, you know, at times the whole industry looks like a bunch of idiots. Uh, what's really interesting is the DeFi stuff, the on-chain stuff, worked like it was supposed to work. It was transparent, right? People got stopped out when they were supposed to be getting stopped out. There's no, oh, he lied to me. I can't believe that. I, I, I didn't know the rules, right? It was all on chain. And so in lots of ways, as, as ironic as this sounds, this crisis is somewhat an advertisement for more transparency and more DeFi. So if you think about what you're saying about this flywheel of effects and a credit crisis that was caused, are we still going to see much more? Is that flywheel still spinning? I don't think, I think, listen, I think what you saw was a cascading of stops. And so the, the, the margin losses all uh, got hit in that move, literally from 29,000 to 17 or 18,000, whatever the low was, all at once. And I had hoped this year, you know, 2830 would be the low. And I was d darn wrong because I didn't realize the magnitude of the, the, the leverage in the system. So we had that deleveraging really fast. And after that, what you're seeing was asset disposals. Uh, and so once you deleverage, you still have, you know, if you're a company that's gone bankrupt, you owe, owe your creditors back the money. So if you have a pile of stuff, it needs to get sold. Um, and so you saw a lot of that in the last couple of weeks. Uh, a couple of the big credit funds were just selling, you know, selling their wrap Bitcoin, selling their their ETH selling their liquid stuff. Uh, I think lots of hedge funds uh, are out of business and they don't know it yet. <laughs> you know, uh, once the redemption notices come in, people are like, you know, you've lost 60% of my money, give me back the 40 cents. Um, right? There are, I think there were 1,400 hedge funds in the space. That's up from 400 two years ago. Uh, it won't surprise me if that number heads back to where it used to be. And so, that weighed on the market and will continue to weigh on the market some as, you know, asset sales happen. Uh, but I think the worst happened. 
And now we're rebuilding. We've had a couple of good days in a row. There's a good story with Ethereum and the merge. Um, you know, the global macro markets are at max bearishness, right? Like the Bank of America put out a piece today that said they haven't seen equity bearishness like this since October of 08. And so you might see a respite here for a while, though we won't get a sustainable next leg of the crypto bull market until a little bit more of this damage is healed and a new narrative emerges. And to that end, that's an extraordinary amount of liquidations that you see coming, thousands, many thousands. And so if that is the case, how is there not more pain? How is there not more selling? You know, listen, when you hit max fear, that normally is a bottom. I'm not saying 100% we had the bottom, but it feels like that was a pretty good shot at it. And so you can go for long periods of time where you have ranges. You go up a little on enthusiasm and someone has to sell it. And, you know, that selling is not for selling right now. Um, and so we had the forced selling. That's the most pain. There's no more forced selling. There's no leverage in the system. And so I don't think you'll see a lot of forced selling. And people aren't going to give up on crypto. But you have to remember, crypto comes from a belief that the traditional institutions are less trusted, right? Our central banks aren't responsible, that our politicians are moving to becoming populist and spending money they don't have. Uh, if you look around the world, and if you look around the U.S., trust is at an all-time low. <laughs> you know, we're looking at a potential election of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. People want to shoot themselves, um, <laughs> right? Uh, and so to, to think all of a sudden trust is healed and we're all going to be good is, is insane. You know, the Fed has a brutally difficult job. Uh, we had 9.1% inflation headline last month. We see the economy slowing dramatically. The Fed funds curve is saying, well, they're gonna hike two and a half, three more times, and then they're gonna cut 75 basis points. That's a wacky shaped curve. Uh, Jay Clayton, I'm Jay Clayton, <laughs> Jay Clayton's back there. Jay Powell has a really tough job, right? He needs to kill inflation expectations and bring inflation back heading lower, but pretty soon people are going to be screaming recession. And like, will he be able to land that plane? Maybe. But I think the markets will bet he's going to flinch. He's going to have to start, stop hiking rates before inflation really gets cemented. And then if they have to cut, you're going to say, see inflation take back off. And so the, the macro case for, for crypto is still there. So let's talk about some of the, the central thesis, and that's trust. And to your point earlier that you made, a lot of retail investors have lost a lot of money. And yeah. in this kind of um, world where we're seeing bankruptcy proceedings and we're seeing, you know, large investors versus small investors, you know, line up for claims, some of them with a lot of money on the line, how does the retail investor get protected anymore? Well, you know, one of the, the most frustrating things is that breakdown of trust. I have a wrestling coach friend of mine that had a huge amount of his savings in crypto. And then he told me the last, you know, he, I knew he had money in crypto and he had Bitcoin and he'd call me for advice. And then he said, oh, it was all with Celsius. And I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding. Um, and he said, what do I do? I was like, you broadly wait, you file your claim and you'll, who, who knows what you'll get back, but you kind of write it off in your head and hopefully it comes back and you get 40 cents on the dollar or maybe more, maybe less. Um, yeah, that's absolutely no good. I think probably, you know, the regulator, you could ask Jay, they have a tough job. They, you know, the SEC under Gensler was in the offices of both BlockFi and Celsius, right? They had already made a settlement with BlockFi. Um, but they were allowing these institutions to take a huge amount of leverage, take retail deposits in, gamble them like they were hedge funds. And so, again, I don't know what the, what the SEC should have done or could have done or might have done but they didn't do a lot to protect the retail investor in those two organizations when they were in their offices, right? And so it's a very hard thing to figure out what the right scheme should be. Uh, I think it's, investors are gonna learn to be a little more leery of who they trust, right? Even, you know, crypto at some exchanges, you know, does, is the exchange well capitalized? Is, is they, do they have insurance? Can they use your crypto? Uh, to be joint. I mean, what was interesting in these cases is normally if it was a retail institution in, in, in TradeFi, 
retail depositors stand way above the, the senior creditors. They get their money back first, and they're insured. In these cases, it's not clear if creditors and retail depositors are traded the same. And so that money is just almost fungible at this point. And so I think you're gonna see changes in regulation, you should. Um, and I think retail is going to be more leery. But the human instinct to want to gamble and make your life better doesn't go away. It is literally inbred in us almost. And so the moment you hit equilibrium, momentum will start showing up on the speculative side again. To the extent that behaviors need to change in crypto, to the extent that certain things just need to be washed out, of all the things that you've seen happen over the last you know, couple of years riding into this historic bull market, what are the things that just have to go? I would love to see more transparency of, you know, like in, with Galaxy stock, if you own more than 5% of it, you've got to declare you own more than 5% of it. And every time you sell, it gets published. If you're an insider, every time you sell, it gets published. If I had sold a billion dollars of Galaxy stock and not told anybody about it, I'd go to jail. Um, but in these crypto ecosystems, the founders, the founding groups, the, the VCs that, that participate, uh, no matter what they own can sell as much as they want not tell anybody and that develops a sense of unfairness um and so disclosure amongst large holders in the same way would make sense i've actually argued many a time that if you launched a protocol they should will uh, willingly do that and some do and some do uh I think that would be a start it's how you build trust with the people that you want to invest in your company or your protocol or your community and that's that's a start um i think what we deal with retail there should be uh more caution like the disclosure i'm sure if i went on celsius or BlockFi's website somewhere in the fine print it says exactly what they were allowed to do but i know because i my heart doctor i saw just friday who lost a million dollars uh in celsius all his bitcoin uh, and was really upset uh, I was like, I'm, now I'm thinking about, I'm not worried about his heart instead of him worrying about my heart. <laughs> um, you know, they, no one reads the fine print. He, he, he assumed that was like a bank account. I was like, oh, dude. Uh, and so the disclosure amongst taking retail deposits or retail should be much, much higher. Uh, so how does that pair with then, you know, earlier you were saying DeFi worked. Oh, a lot of your peers and rivals are saying CFI didn't. Yeah, that's true. And so how then, as you see the industry evolve, how is this also just not, you know, same industry, new clothes? Well, it turns out there was, like, you know, when some reporter called me, I started seeing from Beauty and the Beast, tale as old as time. Uh, tale as old as time. This, this was same industry, new clothes, uh, right? The mistakes that were made in those, all, those, all those organizations I was talking about have happened time immemorial. I mean, you know, household finance with the mortgages, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, uh, asset liability mismatch, too much leverage. Uh, and so what on-chain stuff did is you saw it right there. And that didn't mean people didn't lose money, but there was no, oh my goodness, I got lied to. No, you, you weren't lied to, it was right, it was right on chain. And so I do think you'll see a push towards more transparency, both in CFI and DeFi. I mean, DeFi has it. Um, it's complicated on how to use DeFi, right? You, if you're the wrestling coach uh, from Iowa and you're not a complete computer nerd diving in or a crypto degen and you want to participate, it's difficult to figure out how to get your money onto Ave Pro or Ave or Compound or, you know, move money from MetaMask to, like, that's all really complicated. And so one of the things I think you're going to see in the industry is an acceleration of better user experience, user interface, much more intuitive ways for people to invest. Speaking of investing, you know, I asked earlier about the washout in the industry among investors, among funds, but what about projects themselves? If you kind of have to realign the way you invest in the wake of this crypto winter, how are you rethinking your entire portfolio and what are you now avoiding? Um, listen, I still think Bitcoin is really unique in that it's got a lane of store of value and that it's kind of an anti-populist asset. 
And I don't see politics not being populist and populist governments spend more money than they have. And, you know, if it wasn't for Joe Manchin, we'd really be going the other direction. Um, you know, he's holding the line of spending more money than we have. But the Republicans, you know, under Trump spent way more money than we had and then the Democrats did. And I don't see that shifting. Um, and so I think Bitcoin continues to have an be an asset you need in your portfolio. Um, the other side of crypto, in some ways, the much more exciting side, right? Web3, the, this big blockchain that's being built, which will, I think, be based around Ethereum, but Polygon, lots of other players will have a piece of it, right? Ethereum will never be the blockchain to solve all solutions. It will be fast enough. You have this modularization of blockchains. It becomes a pretty technical bet. Trust the professionals in some ways. Um, that's not going away. Uh, it really isn't. What I think is more unique is what gets built on top. In, in that case, one of the mistakes I think this industry made, and in, in, in whoever in, in, interviews Jay can ask, because the regulatory environment isn't clear, a lot of protocols built governance tokens or token economics to kind of weave their way through not being seen as a security and you know being a utility token and so not being able to be regulated that wasn't necessarily the right thing with hindsight right tokens should be intuitive to the investor on hey if i invest in uniswap and everybody's using uniswap which is this beautiful decentralized exchange i should profit somehow directly it should look more like a security token than the governance token of uniswap now or when i think of things like the BNB &B token, right, CZ's token, which he was able to pay all his employees in, which is kind of a miracle. Um, you know, you were able to buy it originally and get a discount on the brokerage fees, but it was really used as a proxy of equity. If they made profits, they would burn some of the supply. You didn't get any of the, the, the profits that you would potentially, you know, create this derivative, not even linked derivative. Um, that's kind of a BS token economic system that doesn't, won't survive the test of time. It becomes uh, invest in, it could be like the Novo token. You invest in the Novo token and you get to come and have lunch with Novo once a month if you own the token. And after one lunch, people are bored of it. And they're like, so no, people will own the token, but they never take up the lunch. Uh, no one used, I shouldn't say no one, very few people used the token of BNB to get that discount. Um, they morph their token into more of a blockchain and it's become third, the third or fourth biggest token. I'm not, not bad-mouthing it, but the token economics weren't clear. And I think the next chapter, we're going to have to have token economics that make more sense to people, uh, that I can be able to explain them to somebody really clearly. And that's just not the case. I could ask you about a million tokens. We only have a minute or so left, and so I do have to go back to some of your own predictions, and that includes <laughs> for Bitcoin. You've told me uh, very recently that you still think, within the last couple months, that you think that Bitcoin in the next five years or so can get to 500,000. I do. I do. Um, listen, this is a story about two things. It's about adoption and it's about global economics. And while this is a bump in the road in adoption, it's certainly not a U-turn. Um, we continue to see institutions in Europe, in the Mideast, in the U.S., who haven't gotten involved yet looking at this as an opportunity. And they're not diving with two feet right now because people that work in institutions are a little more cautious. But once we get balance, once we get equilibrium and start a new narrative, they'll be back. And I just don't see, when I look at the global landscape between Europe, Japan, the US, China, how fiscal prudence gets put back in a box. We have debt to GDP over 140%. That almost never ends without a debt restructuring or a hyperinflation, right? Listen, we had 9% inflation this year, so they did a pretty decent job of taking 9%, or well, 3% rates, 9% inflation, you take 6% off the debt. Uh, you need to do that for a long time, and people get really angry when you have high inflation, right? You see what happened in Sri Lanka right now. I mean, that's an extreme case. But so we're in this really tenuous environment. When I think about it, this is the golden age of macro starting, 
this was the first year. Like my old job being a macro investor, I can't think of a better job to have for the next five or six years. Well, what has to change? Has your timeline changed at all? Because you have to add four hundred eighty thousand dollars of value by twenty twenty seven to get to where you are saying, and overlaying that with the fact that risk taking is going down, the Federal Reserve is tightening and not. Yeah, but the Federal Reserve is tightening, but we'll see how much more they can tighten before they break the back of the economy and have to start cutting again. So my point is you take a longer view. How do you get 140% debt to GDP and forget what it is in Japan and Europe back to sustainable levels without bankrupting your, bankrupting your grandkids? The only way you do it, there's only one way, is inflating your way out. And so hard assets are going to win. Now, Bitcoin's not the only hard asset. Gold, real estate, REITs, there are plenty of hard assets you should have in your portfolio. But Bitcoin is a unique one, uh, and it is gaining adoption. And so I was kidding. Like, I've been talking the Bitcoin story for a long time. It's time to pass the torch to some other people that really know how to tell the Bitcoin story. But there will be a generation of people that really believe in this that are convincing their friends and their communities and their institutions that this is a good way to store wealth, right? It is very unique and there are only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be made. It is tailor-made to being an anti-inflation store of value. Uh, it is easily transferable. Uh, and so it's better than gold in so many ways. Now I sound like Michael Saylor. Um, uh, and so when I say it's adoption, it really is people telling that story and getting people to believe it. That's what creates stores of value. That's how gold became gold. Gold is still a $9 to $10 trillion asset. You can take all the gold in the world and it broadly fits in this room. That's ever been mined. A little bit bigger than this room. Think about that. That's $10 trillion. It would be like a sculpture. Uh, gold is only valuable because we say it's valuable. It's the same way Bitcoin is happening. And it's happening because of the network effect of the internet of community of how fast information goes. But I don't think that goes backwards.